I'm very happy to be able to announce this week's speaker in our Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. It's uh, Judy Estrin. She is the CEO of Packet Design, and she's former Chief Technical Officer, CTO, and Senior Vice President at Cisco, Cisco Systems. Uh, she's got an awfully long history as an innovator and as a technology executive and an entrepreneur. And she's going to tell you some of her history as, as she gets into the presentation. But um, the, the net result of all of this is that she's really just an ideal person to, um, to, to address both the area of innovation as well as the uh, area of entrepreneurship. So with that, I'm very pleased to have Judy Estrin. Thank you, um, except that I was already feeling old looking out at the audience, and then when you talk about a long history, it makes me feel older. But I started very young. Um, I thought, uh, when I thought about this talk um, today, what I talk a lot about these days is innovation, and you'll see in a minute why, which is I'm in the middle of writing a book about it. Um, but I figured that as uh, students, what's more on your minds right now is really what you're going to do when you get out of here. And so I decided uh, to really split it into two. The first half of the talk is more an entrepreneurial lessons learned. And I'll take you just through my, uh, my bio with uh, just some pointing out what were the things I learned al along the way and why I made uh, some of the decisions I did. Again, we don't have a lot of time, so it'll be the highlight of it. And then I did want to include at the end uh, some slides about innovation, because to me, um, you represent our future. And if you're not thinking about innovation in the right way, the world will not be a very innovative place. And so um, one of my concerns and one of my hot buttons these days is that we're not thinking about innovation broadly enough. And so uh, I wanted to get out of the soapbox a little bit at the end and, and talk about that. And um, I'm going to try to leave, I'm, I am going to leave time for questions. And one of the things I was thinking about coming up here is that uh, today, and any of you who have read the papers today or gone to Google and seen, uh, happened to notice Google's icon, uh, may know that it's the 50th anniversary of the launching of Sputnik. Now, I am um, old enough to have been alive, but not old enough to remember it. <laughs> Um, I was uh, three at the time, or almost three. But it was a very, very important event in terms of this country's embracement of science and what happened uh, to the support of science and technology in this country for the uh, decades that followed. Because it was the launching of Sputnik by the Russians that made us suddenly feel vulnerable and uh, essentially knocked us down a notch in terms of our arrogance as a country. And, um, I think it's important as we're about to talk about entrepreneurialism and innovation to just think a moment about that because you know what? We got knocked down a notch, we brought ourselves back up, and we are as arrogant today as we were before the Russians launched Sputnik. And so uh, it's really important to think about uh, um, what we need to do going forward. And, um, one person I interviewed for my book uh, was the guy who runs SRI, uh, Kurt Carlson. And he started off my interview, and actually he was one of the few people who said, you know, this is the most exciting time to be an engineer or to be a scientist. And um, I know I feel that way, but a lot of people don't. And the reason is there are so many problems that we need to solve big problems, whether it is climate change, whether it is energy dependence, whether it is uh, disease, whether it is water, I mean, I can go on and on and on. All of those problems, even terrorism, science and technology play a role in addressing and solving. And so, uh, frankly, I wish I was sitting where you guys were sitting, uh, looking out at uh, um, opportunities in career, because it is a wonderful time and there is a, um, an incredible time for engineers and scientists and for the, I guess, a quarter of you who are MBA students, for, for you also, because nothing happens without the business side going along with it. Um, I thought I'd just start off as I'm going through my background. I know when I listen to people talk, I kind of like to know where th what their biases are and where they came from. So uh, a snapshot of my pre-work world was um, 
I, I'm kind of an academic brat. I grew up in a scientific uh, world. I was not uh, uh, so much influenced by Sputnik as my parents were. And um, both of them are PhDs in electrical engineering. So I grew up into that environment. I personally fell in love with computer science very, very young. Um, and it really appealed to my problem solving, uh, love for problem solving. As you'll see in a minute, I very quickly left pure engineering and moved into management. So it, it was interesting to me in that I started out on a very deep technical path, never imagining that I was going to be an entrepreneur, never imagining that I was going to be interested in business, but ended up uh, kind of being pulled along as opposed to planning uh, my career. Um, I was involved in the very early internet with Vince Cerf, who was my advisor at Stanford. I don't have up here, I should say, I did my undergrad at UCLA. I did my master's at Stanford. Uh, but my younger sister did her undergrad at Berkeley. So I do have some <laughs> Berkeley affiliation. Um, one of the interesting things you'll hear coming from me the, that may be different from other people you hear uh, talk, I never had to climb a corporate ladder. From the beginning, I started at a small company, and then I built my own companies. Um, and so I never had to deal with the politics of climbing up to the top. And um, people used to ask me about glass ceilings as a woman. I built my own ho houses, so I didn't have to worry about glass ceilings. And so I have some slightly different attitudes um, that come from that. And then last, um, I have done a lot of things that I'm excited about in my career. My most important achievement is actually my 17-year-old son. And the reason I put it up here is, um, no, you can't have it all. You can't do everything. You can't uh, uh, do everything all the time. But you can balance a very exciting career and a family and be very committed to both. And it's hard, and it takes a lot of juggling. But whenever I'm talking to people who are at the beginning of their career, I just like to reinforce that you have to make trade-offs. And there are t there's good times and bad times of looking at when you emphasize career, when you emphasize family. But you can do it both, and you can uh, be very successful at both. So um, I graduated Stanford. and. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just knew I was a software engineer, and I was going to go get a software engineering job. This was in 1976. And um, got offers from Xerox and Intel and HP, lots of big companies. And then I got an offer from this little company called Zilog. I didn't even know what a startup was. Again, back in 76, startups were not as common as they were today. I certainly did not know what a stock option was. And, um, I went to Zilog because a friend of my parents said that the smartest people that he knew were at this company. And I said to myself, you know what? I want to be working with smart people. And I think that is something that has uh, um, certainly been a theme of my career, which is first going to a place to be with the smartest people I knew. But then later, as I was building companies and hiring, um, was to always look to be surrounded about uh, uh, by the smartest people that, um, that I could find. I, I immediately fell in love with the, the passion involved in a small startup company and the scope, the opportunity to do lots of different things, to be in touch with the customer even though I was a, a software engineer. I ended up moving into management in two years. Um, I found out that I actually wasn't a nerd. Um, now, that's not a bad thing, um, meaning it, being a nerd is a good thing if you love love, love to be working with machines and working in front of a computer. And I found I was an OK software engineer, but you know what I really loved was the people interaction and explaining the technology to people and leading people. So I, after two years, moved on to a management track. But I want to reinforce that uh, the world needs both. And so I see too many really good technical people decide they should be managers because they think there's more respect in the management track. And I think that companies make a big mistake when they do that. And reinforcing uh, the need for people who are really deep in the technology is, is very, very important. Um, the main lessons that I learned at Zilog was that you can build the best product in the world if you don't have the right ma uh, marketing and sales channels, nothing happens. And I didn't know anything about marketing and sales at Zilog. I thought it was this necessary evil. And it was my first lesson in how important knowing how to sell and market a product really uh, comes. We um, had the first commercial local area network. 
we had a general purpose computer. This again was in uh, the 79 time frame, a general purpose computer running a word processor way before Microsoft and Intel were building uh, PCs. But unfortunately, the management just did not understand what it was, thought it was a chip company, and so we never really did anything with it. From there, in 1981, and, and this part of the slide, uh, I started out as an I. This part of the slide becomes a we for, uh, uh, for one slide because I then started the part of my career as a serial entrepreneur with myself and my ex-husband Bill Carrico <coughs> and we uh, went on to found um, three companies. The first was Bridge Communications and I guess I'd label this uh, as who needs experience. I was 26, he was 31, we didn't have much experience, we had a passion, we had a vision. Although, I will say we did have some experience, and I see a lot of uh, students come to me these days and saying, I'm going to graduate, and then I'm going to go start a company. And one of the things that I think is very important is that I think it's better to go work for at least a couple of years, whether it's at a big company or another startup, but to get some experience before you actually go uh, start your own company or get involved in a startup that has people that have experience because although you don't have to have experience starting a company to start a company, having some experience with a product cycle and what it actually is like to bring products to market and talk to customers is just something you can't learn in a university environment. And those entrepreneurs who have gotten some of that experience, in my opinion, are more successful than those that go straight to trying to uh, start a company. There are obviously exceptions, and we can all, all hear stories of the people who went you know, right from uh, university into starting a company. Um, I think one of the most important things that uh, um, I learned at Bridge was about flexibility, and the need for flexibility, adaptability, and not getting too cocky. And those it came along the way. Bridge was very successful. Uh, we, we grew fast, took the company public. We ended up selling the company to 3Com um, because we believed that as the market was changing, we needed to embrace uh, PC technology. People don't know it, but Bridge actually shipped the first commercial router. Cisco claims to have, but Bridge actually uh, did ship it. Um, and, uh, but along the way, we had to constantly be adapting to changes in the marketplace. And, and one of the things as an entrepreneur you really, really have to be alert to is not being wishy-washy, but just really being tuned into the customer, the competitors, who's coming from behind, uh, looking out ahead, and being ready to adapt and be uh, flexible in terms of your products, your approach. Because a lot of a startup is trying something out. You don't know exactly what the formula is to either make it or sell it. And so some people call it a random walk in the beginning as you're trying to figure out what is the exact right place for this technology and the right packaging for the technology. And it also takes patience. And in those days, uh, VCs had patience. They, they don't so much anymore uh, these days. Um, we then merged the company, uh, learned that uh, mergers are way harder than you think. And um, Bill and I left after about nine months. Started a company called, or co-founded with a uh, group of engineers, a company called Network Computing Devices. This was one of the first X terminals. Um, thin clients before thin clients were really uh, popular. And um, whereas at Bridge, we went to the VCs and said, who cares about experience? We don't need experience. Just fund us. We you know, we know what we're doing. Um, interestingly enough, uh, at Bridge, about a month before our funding closed, we already had commitments from uh, the funders, a market research report came out saying that Ethernet was going to die, and our whole business plan was based on Ethernet, um, and that Wang was going to win with their uh, special technology. This was before Ethernet was standardized. And um, our investors got very nervous. We had to go reconvince them that we believed we had picked the right choice. In the end, they invested, and uh, we were right. But it. Um, it was a very, very hard fundraising process. It took six months to raise money for our first company. At NCD, because we had experience, uh, it took about six minutes. So we called up those same funders and we said, here's our business plan. And they said, fine, how much money do you want? And gave us the money. So um, on one hand, at Bridge, I want to say who needs experience. 
Um, on the other hand, clearly experience does uh, help. Um, MCD was actually very humbling for, uh, for us because it grew very fast, but then it hit a wall because the PC Unix market dynamics shifted. It was out of our control, but we went up very fast and then started to flatten out. Um, it was at a time when my son was four and I wanted to take a break. I was CEO at the time. Uh, it was my first lesson in how hard it is to find good leadership because I hired a replacement uh, for myself who proceeded to take the company and take it from flat to, to straight down. And unfortunately, the company was not uh, viewed as a long-term success. Lesson here was no one to sell. Uh, when, uh, when I turned the company over to the new CEO, one of the, my messages is, this is a great time to sell this company. And he was absolutely convinced that he could take it. He was way smarter than we were. He could do great things. He did not sell it. By the time he wanted to sell it, nobody wanted to buy it. And then um, we took six months off and realized what we were not good at was retiring and um, started a company called Precept in 1995. This was the beginning of the bubble. Um, and Precept did video streaming software over IP. Actually, the name of our product was IPTV. Uh, and believe it or not, Cisco gave up the trademark when they acquired the company. And now um, uh, it's used all the time. But it, um, we were the first ones to actually coin the term IPTV. And I, I think the key lessons from here is we were assuming a certain infrastructure. We were based on something called multicast, which is a, a type of networking that wasn't there. And so our product, we couldn't get critical mass because it, the infrastructure was not ready for our product to ride on top of it. And um, by the time the infrastructure was in place, it was three years into the company, Mic it had, Microsoft and other large companies had a chance to catch up. And the main advantage of a startup is you need to be able to get critical mass before the big guys come into the market. And if something, whether it's infrastructure or your mistakes or execution, stops you from getting that critical mass in that first couple of years, and it's a market that's going to be big, you've lost your opportunity because the big guys come into the market and often you've lost your advantage to get that critical mass. Now, we had done something very smart, which is we had partnered with Cisco. And so at the point it was clear that the market was taking off and a small company could not do it on its own. Uh, Cisco acquired us. I agreed to become Cisco's CTO as part of it. Um, here's a case again of just making a decision of what was right for the company. In fact, the motto is I was not looking for a CTO job at, at the time. But it was right for the company. And uh, as part of the acquisition, I became Cisco CTO and suddenly found myself for the first time at a big company. Um, people usually do it in reverse. Usually start your career at a big company and then spin out. I had always been at these small companies. And the most fascinating for me, thing for me was to all of a sudden realize what it felt like to be the gorilla. Um, because Cisco at this point was 18,000 people. And in the two years that I was there, they grew from 18,000 to 30, do I have it up here? 36,000 people in the company. This was the peak of the bubble. I left in April of 2000. And so that was actually the, the, the real peak of, uh, of the internet bubble. Um, it was my first experience working in a large company, which was uh, interesting in terms of the dynamics, the politics. Um, it was also my first experience with what a CTO actually did. And some of you may end up being CTOs. And I would say that the role of the CTO is one of the least defined, well-defined roles of anything in a company. But I define the CT role of a CTO really in two ways. Uh, one is that the role of a CTO is to look forward and look across in a company, the things that the business people can't actually do. But another way to define the role of a CTO is the role of a CTO is to ask questions of everybody, of management, of engineers, of customers. And just by asking the right questions, a CTO can get an organization to do things um, often more so than the, the line management um, can. Um, what I mainly learned at, learned at Cisco is I didn't want to work for someone else. I, I had worked for myself for long enough. And uh, working in someone else's culture was not the right thing for me. It was a fascinating time to be there, but in 2000, decided to go back to um, 
creating something new. And one of the things that I was very concerned about during the bubble was that the industry had become incredibly short-term focused. We were all chasing the opportunity. There was so much opportunity out there that everybody just had become frenetic and nobody was looking long-term um, in terms of innovation, in terms of anything, um, because people were running to keep up with the demand that existed as the bubble uh, was growing. So when I left, uh, we decided to start to do an experiment and start a company with a very different business model uh, called Packet Design. And Packet Design did medium-term research. And then the idea was to spin out the technology as independent companies. And it was supposed to be a perpetual startup, in, in our opinion. So the fact of the matter is we were very successful at developing technology. We developed some fantastic technology. But it was 2000 when we started. And we all know, anybody who has looked at, been alive for the last 10 years, knows what happened in 2000, 2001, 2002 um, to the economy, to the industry, and to the networking industry got uh, hit probably harder than, than most. So as a company, Packet Design was not real successful. As a business model, it didn't work. And we still might return some money to our investors. But as an exercise in innovation, it was phenomenally successful because we were able to create an environment where we really did create some very interesting technologies and spun out three companies. Um, one was shut down, but two of which are there today selling uh, good products to uh, their customers. Um, so the lesson here is you have to try. Um, to know whether something's going to work or not. And sometimes it doesn't work the way you think. And sometimes uh, things are just completely out of your control, whether it's uh, corporate scandals, the, the burst of the bubble, or 9-11 were none of the things, nothing that we could uh, predict. So sitting here today, what do I do? Um, uh, packet design has actually been wound down. It really is, uh, somebody was saying, it used to be a holding company for the equity in the spin-outs. Now it's a holding company for me, meaning we've pretty much distributed the assets to our investors, but I have kept the company as a vehicle with which I do lots of different things. And um, the, the things I do really fall into two categories. One is sitting on boards, and I sit on uh, board, the board of the Walt Disney Company, which I have been on since uh, 98, Federal Express, uh, which I've actually been on since 89. Um, and then two small companies, Packet Design Inc. is one of our uh, spin-outs from Packet Design, and Archrock Inc., which is actually a spin-out out of Berkeley um, in the Sensornet area, Dave Culler, um, <coughs> who actually just returned to Berkeley and took a leave in order to, to start the company. And act most of my time now is actually going into writing a book about um, innovation and entrepreneurialism with the focus on innovation. And I will say that um, the same way I said early on that I never thought I would end up having a career in business and being an entrepreneur, I never, ever, ever thought I would be writing a book. So part of the, the reason I emphasize this is that um, it's fine to make plans and it is fine to look ahead and say, how do I get the right fundamentals in place so that I have options to take advantage of things that I might do down the line. But um, when I meet somebody who comes and tells me what their 10-year plan is, and they're going to be at this point, and then they're going to do this, and then they're going to do this, and this is how they're going to get to be CEO or whatever they aspire uh, to be, um, I always think to myself, you know what? It probably won't turn out that way. And so another way to look at it is building the tool chest and just putting, um, gathering up the capabilities that you will need to react to change and react to opportunities when it came along. Because in the end, when I think about how my career evolved and why it was able to evolve was because I had the fundamentals. And I had the fundamentals, and then I was willing to put in the effort um, and the amount of work it took at every step in the game to do what we did, as well as be open to take a, a, turn, a right turn or a left turn as opportunities uh, um, presented themselves. Again, 
I never wanted to be CTO at Cisco. That was like the last job I would have imagined wanting to do. But at the time, right exit strategy for my company. And um, it ended up being a fascinating experience. Did I want to do it for life? No. But for the two years, it was a fascinating experience. So I, I can't reinforce enough this notion of <clears throat> building the fundamentals and then really being able to react to what you're passionate about. Because the other um, lesson I would say that I've learned most is I've been the most successful when I've been doing things that I was uh, the most excited about. I never started a company because I decided I wanted to start a company. Every one of the companies we started was because we were passionate about an area or an idea, and we said, you know what, we could turn this into X. And I'm not writing a book because I decided I wanted to write a book. Um, the fact of the matter is, I don't really like to write. But I'm writing a book because I'm passionate about a topic, and I decided that I wanted a broader vehicle to get that information um, out. So um, I can't reinforce enough the notion of building the fundamentals and keeping your mind open to look for opportunities. So the same flexibility that I mentioned when I was talking about bridge, when you're in a company, is true in life, which is that willingness to adapt and that willingness to uh, say, hey, you know what? This really excites me, and I'm going to go pursue it and try it. And if it doesn't work, you back up and you go look for some, something else. So I'm going to stop the entrepreneurial lessons part and move into the, uh, a couple slides about innovation, and then I'll open it up to talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. Um, hopefully, some of what I've been talking about falls into that category. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, a couple of different elements about innovation. A lot of people talk about innovation. There's a lot of different definitions for innovation. Most people think of innovation as something that you have to have as a checkoff item in a company. You better be innovative, or else you're not different and new. Um, but I think, actually, not enough people really understand what it takes to have an innovative culture, and what it takes for a company to be innovative or for a person to be innovative. So I'm going to talk about what are some of those fundamental elements that need to be uh, in the culture. There is no recipe for innovation. There is no five steps to success through innovation. What there is is the ability to understand and then adapt it to your own uh, style, whether it's you personally or a company or a class um, or the country. Um, so the listed here are what I would say are really the fundamentals of innovation. First is, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is that innovation is not predictable. It's, in fact, very messy. And I'll come back to this and talk about why this is such an important thing to grasp. Um, second, you have to have a culture that has what I call a capacity for change. If you have an, an environment, again, in your head as a person or in a company, that is not open to change, then innovation is going to get squelched. Because innovation starts with often very weird ideas. And if you immediately shut your mind to anything that doesn't look like what you're already thinking about, you are not going to end up uh, having innovation. And I'm going to talk about in a minute about the, the core values. Um, people matter. And we spend a lot of time um, thinking about diversity and thinking about how in this country or in companies, you, how to be fair, how to be equal. That is all very important, and I am not detracting that from that. But it's also important to understand that there are some people who are more innovative or better at engineering or science or marketing than others. And you can't treat everybody uniformly all the time. You want to give equal, equal opportunity, but that's different than uniformity. Because if you believe everybody is equal, sorry, everybody is the same, everybody should be treated equally, but they should not be treated the same. And if you believe that everybody is identical, then you do not have people of various talents able to rise above. And it takes diversity of expertise 
to create innovation. Now, everything I've just said is not that one person is better than another or smarter than another, but people are different and have different sets of talent. And it's really, really important to be able to look at teams and say, you know what, I'm going to go find the best people for this job. And to try not to let a trend towards um, uniformity take away from the best talent for a given situation. Now, what I just said may not come across sounding like I believe in equal opportunity. That's not true. It ha but companies have to be able to reward people differently. And they have to be able to, we have to be able to educate people differently. If somebody is inherently better in science, then we should educate them differently in science than somebody who is inherently better in English or in history or in um, so, some other topic. And so uh, this is probably, I think, one of the key limitations big companies have, is the bigger you get, the more you want to treat everybody the same. You have these pay scales, and you don't want to do something special for somebody who is, really has unique creativity. Um, I'll talk a minute. Innovation needs to be nurtured, not managed. And I'll come back to this. And I'll come back to the last one, which is sustainable innovation as a country requires an ecosystem. And, and I'll explain this when, when I come to it. So one slide just about this notion of innovation being um, not being predictable and being messy. Um, one of the problems people have is they want to uh, uh, schedule innovation. <laughs> And you can't schedule innovation because innovation is really a cycle that starts with identifying needs. And probably one of the most important aspects of innovation is identifying needs and then framing those needs as a question to be answered. And the framing of the question is very not an easy thing to do. Because if you frame a narrow question, you're going to get narrow innovation. If you frame a broad question, you give more room to explore. So if you're a researcher, the questions are very broad. If you're in a development company and you need to get a product out in a couple of weeks, you want those questions to be more narrow. So the framing of the question, you then have ideas. You then need to try and test those ideas. You then need to assess and learn from those trials and tests. And you need to be honest in that assessment. But the fact of the matter is at any given time, you might loop back because your trial might not work. Or you might not, the idea might not have been a good one. Or you find that you didn't frame the right question. And you get all the way to assessing and learning and realizing, you know what, I didn't really ask the right question of the customer. Or I didn't really frame the question for my experiment. And you have to go all the way back. So you might go through this uh, multiple times before you end up with something that is an innovation that is really worth something. So it is very hard to schedule. It's why you can't schedule research. And um, there is a difference between the type of innovation you can have in a development environment, which is usually incremental innovation or small innovations, versus broad disruptive innovation that you can do at a startup because you have a clean slate and you can go around this circle a little bit while you're writing your business plan, before you've gotten your money. Once you get your money, then you, you're typically wanting to be coming out this path, understanding what it is that, that you're going to build. Um, and I'll come back to this when I talk about why large companies have such uh, a hard time being um, innovative. There are five what I call core values of innovation. And I would say that these apply, again, personally to organizations and are critical to, when we, uh, to the country. When we look at what the culture of the country needs to be, how we need to educate, uh, whether it's in universities or K through 12 education. The first is questioning. Um, this means curiosity. It means self-assessment. It means being uh, willing to ask questions as an innovator and leaders uh, encouraging questions. So questioning is probably the, the most important thing in innovation. And it sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised how many companies you go talk to employees and they say, I'd never ask that question of x. Or um, you can look at the country today and how questioning is actually not encouraged the way it was in the past. Um, so questioning is one of the most uh, important aspects. And it needs to be inquisitive, not judgmental. How you frame a question 
makes the difference between you, whether or not you sound judgmental, which will make people close up and not innovate, or uh, open up and explore. Um, risk taking, everybody talks about risk. What does risk mean? And I'm going to uh, show one more slide on this. What it really means is being willing to fail, and it being OK to fail, and even rewarding failure at times. Because if you really want to let people know it's OK to try, then you have to let people know that it's OK to fail. And, it, and, you have, and very few companies actually do this. Everybody will tell you they do it, um, but very few companies actually have a culture where they accept failure as a step to success. Um, openness to imagine, to share, to evidence. And this is one of the things that the culture of this uh, country is losing. And a lot of, uh, a lot of companies that kind of crash and burn do it because they're not paying attention to evidence that they're hearing from their customers, that they're seeing from their competitors, and they're just not listening. They're just so focused that they're not opening to realize that the world has changed or that uh, their products need to change. So openness to other opinions, um, openness to imagine what the future might be like. Patience. Um, investors need to be patient. Innovators need to be tenacious, and that's uh, a, a non-passive version of, of patience. Um, and then trust. If you don't have an environment of trust, then people will be afraid to fail. So underlying all of this needs to be trust. And these five values have to go together. You can't have trust without questioning. That's blind faith. And blind faith may work in some environments, but it's not very innovative. And you cannot have risk taking without questioning. That is what's called the internet bubble. Everybody was taking all these risks without having any data as to what they were taking risks on. So you really, if you have openness or too much patience to the extreme, then you'll just be open loop and never get anything done. So it's really important to kind of think of these as combined values that balance each other off, which create the environment of innovation. I mentioned this before, but I just want to reinforce failure is not a four level, level, level letter word. Um, I did a case study at, at Stanford about packet design. And um, I had everybody I know say, why are you doing a case study for the Stanford Business School about packet design? It wasn't successful. And I said, that's why I'm doing it. Because you know what? When you get an MBA, somebody should stand up and tell you about things that failed. You should not just be <coughs> learning about things that are success, because you learn as much from failures. Um, and I will say again, packet design is not a full failure, but it's a partial failure. And it's really important to, uh, to learn from that. And I would say that the failure to innovate, the failure to innovate is worse than failure from innovation. And um, just as you go out into the world, if you could just keep that in your mind, that um, not trying is the worst thing that you could do. And the other thing is the, the first bullet on here that I, um, I missed that is very, very, very hard for people who have been brought up to succeed to acknowledge to themselves, which is failing is not a personal thing. If you fail, it is not a personal failure. It is a failure of the project. And um, in most cases, it's very hard to separate yourself from the project. What makes you so driven, what makes you so passionate about what you're doing, is you're throwing yourself into it. But in this particular case, you have to just realize that it's not, you're not a failure. Whatever you tried failed. And those are uh, very important things to, to learn how to uh, differentiate. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because I, I want to have time for questions. But let me just say, a lot of people talk about management and management techniques and leadership techniques. Um, what I have found when it comes to innovation, you really need to think about nurturing as opposed to managing. And most of the management techniques of the last couple of decades have been about measuring. Anything that and people say, you can't manage what you can't measure. Well, the fact of the matter is you can't measure innovation. You can only measure innovation in hindsight. While it's going on, 
you can't measure it with metrics. The metric itself will kill the innovation process. So a better analogy when you think about leading innovation, and this is why small companies tend to innovate so much more than large, uh, large companies, is think of it like gardening. And you need the right culture. You need to prepare the soil. You need to make sure that the small ideas get nurtured and give a chance to get some life. Um, you have to proactively prune and thin. You have to cut back over time. You have to make decisions as to what to let grow and what not. Um, and um, the other part of it is that once these little seedlings grow, you often need to transplant them into larger organizations or as a company grows uh, in, from the lab into uh, to the sales force. And transplanting is a very delicate uh, operation. And if you think about it, that's where most projects fail. So whether it's going from the research lab at Berkeley into a small company, or from a small company that's acquired by a bigger company, often that is where the problem happens, because it's in that transplanting that not enough at uh, attention is, is paid. An interesting uh, way to think about this analogy, and again, why startups ending up doing so much of the disruptive innovation. And I would say that if you look at most innovation out there, the significant innovation either comes from startups or research labs. And research labs mostly in universities, some in corporations. Large companies, in the main, do incremental innovation. And it's because they are like farms. They want to mass produce rows and rows of the same thing. And you know what? Surprises are not uh, tolerated. So if you're trying to uh, grow corn or whatever it is you're trying to grow, and there's some little thing popping up, that's not good, because you want something at scale. But if you're planting a garden, and I, I, I should give my ga caveat here that I'm not a gardener, but I, <laughs> I have found that this uh, analogy does work. If you're planting a garden and something sprouts up that you didn't plan, often you look at it and say, oh, that made my garden look nicer. It, what a nice surprise. And for innovation to happen, you have to welcome surprises. You can't be in a situation where you try to kill off surprises. And most management techniques and things like Six Sigma, which were built for manufacturing with focus and efficiency and process and structure and metrics and measurement, all they do serve to do is kill off those surprises. They, we've gotten so efficient in our large companies that there's no room for innovation. We're, they're, they're, we've taken all of the slop out of the system, and that's why uh, innovation doesn't happen. On the other hand, large companies can be like farms, and they can have little greenhouses on the side or small garden plots, or they buy startups. And the startups do the disruptive innovation that then get integrated into the, uh, the large companies. Um, I'm just going to finish by uh, taking a step up a minute. And let's talk about the country as opposed to companies. Um, and I really believe that if we're going to have sustainable innovation, and what I mean by that is the company continuing to innovate over a long period of time, that it takes um, an ecosystem. And I'll show you a slide what I mean by this. But I'm not talking here the business term of ecosystem. The industry uses the term ecosystem to mean partnerships and connections between different companies. I'm actually talking about the biological definition of an ecosystem, which is a dynamic interaction between living organisms, which are the innovators, and their environment. And so let me tell you what I mean by this, which is that to have sustainable innovation, you need to have a balance of three different communities of innovation. The first is the research community, and that is mostly done in academia. But the idea behind research is to further understanding. Nothing about business, and that doesn't mean you're not considering the application. You may have consideration of use, ultimately, but the project itself is for the interest of furthering understanding, and that's why the research that's done in academia is so important. The second community is the development community, which is taking ideas and turning them into products um, that can then be used. And then the third place you can innovate is in the application of those products. So if you look at Google, they started as research 
in the research community and came up with a very interesting algorithm. They became a development in the development community when they had a search product. And it was a product based on search. But what really made Google successful was innovation in this application community when they came up with a new business model, which was their AdWords and figuring out how to link advertising to search, as well as their data center capabilities, their ability to scale their computer systems to manage the amount of information that they manage. And that's an application of science and technology. It actually isn't the development of a product. So Google's a very interesting example of having gone between these different communities. The other important thing is if you look at the little icons around the side, these are the environmental factors that influence innovation. So you can kill in innovation by having the wrong policy, by ha not having the education system pr to produce innovators, having the wrong culture, bad leadership, or not enough funding. Or you can encourage innovation by doing the right things in terms of those different environmental factors. We as a country right now, um, we lost our patience during the bubble. We lost our willingness to take risk at when the bubble crashed and the corporate scandals and 9-11. And in the aftermath of 9-11, um, we pretty much have uh, lost our openness, our questioning, and I think our trust. And so my biggest concern is the culture in the, company, in the country right now doesn't, in, doesn't uh, include those core values that I mentioned. And if you don't have that, you start to undermine uh, the innovation that needs to happen in all of these different areas. One more interesting example of just thinking about this, think about some of the big problems we have. Think about, for instance, uh, uh, climate change or energy dependence. Well, you can start off by making short-term decisions about emission caps or energy usage. And that is in the application community. But in the end, what you need to do is have products that are developed that are more energy efficient or better for the environment. And that's in the development environment. But the real long-term answer is in the research community to be working on research today so that 15, 20, 30 years from now, we have different sources of energy or we have cleaner products or materials so we don't have to worry so much about the caps we put in the application uh, community. So when you're thinking about some of these broad problems, you can't just think about the next iPod or, well, you can, but I hope that you don't just think about going out and in your careers building the next iPod. Great product, very, very important piece of innovation. But when we think about the global problems that we have in the world, they need, we need people in all of these communities in order to solve them. So I'll get off my soapbox now. Um, and just say uh, there's lots of ways to build your career, lots of ways to succeed. Um, hope I gave you a snapshot of some of the decisions I made. But let me say that learning and adjusting is probably one of the, the biggest lessons. And don't underestimate luck. Luck and timing is really a big deal. And so when you look at some people out there that have been phenomenally successful, there's a large element of luck in there. And so you just want to uh, hope that you're picking the right place and are at the right time along the way. Um, the other thing, um, well, you know what, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to go through these because I'm not leaving time for questions. So let me just stop here and take questions. So uh, a lot of us in the room are MBAs at talks where our mantra is leading through innovation. And I'm um, just kind of curious your, your thoughts on how we can approach this experience uh, over the next few years we're here to kind of cultivate um, that the So I think that uh, the first is um, understanding more about it. And, and the, the first step is, is recognizing that innovation isn't just a sound bite, and that it's something that you really have to cultivate and nurture as opposed to um, manage the same way you manage other things. Um, and I think you just fed back to me part of it, which is as much as you can is go look at those core values and question yourself. 
do a self-assessment of yourself, of your classes. How many of your classes are really encouraging you to question? How many of your classes are teaching you to identify problems and needs and figure out how to frame the questions around them? Or are most of your classes just spitting information at you? And the fact of the matter is just spitting information at you is important in some areas. You need that information. But what, what uh, I would hope the MBA schools uh, were doing in this country that are churning out the next leaders is teaching you how to question and teaching you how to develop. The, the one thing I skipped on the slide is um, leading innovation takes a lot of instinct. You have to make decisions without hard data. You have to be able to deal with ambiguity, which is the opposite of a lot of management techniques. And so not everybody is going to become a leader of innovation. There, if you look at your typical spectrum of people who want to go out and eventually become managers or executives or CEOs, many of them are best off managing large-scale processes because they can't deal with ambiguity. That's not bad. It's just different. And so I think uh, as individuals, if you could do some work identifying for yourselves, are you the type of person who wants a career tied up with innovation where you're really talking about dealing with ambiguity, a lot of judgment and instinct, or are you going to be a better operations execution type uh, person? The world needs both. And there are both types of CEOs. If you have a CEO who is very operations driven, they need people who work on their staff who are more innovative in nature. If you have a CEO who is a wild innovator, they always need to be coupled with someone who can make things happen and operate. And there are people who can do, some, do both together. But um, I, think, I think actually starting with those core values and doing some self-assessment and saying, are we embracing them or are we just um, are we just using them as checkoff items? Because I would say most people today and most articles you read are looking at innovation as a checkoff item because it's become the popular word to use as opposed to really understanding it. Um, oh, that's right. Sorry. Um, the question is, are there any role model companies? Um, so let me say, uh, this is true with role model people and role model companies. Um, the trick to role models is to look at the way they do things and say, what is good about the way they do it, and adapt pieces from different people. So even if you're being mentored, for instance. Because every company is different. If you build uh, microprocessors, you can't innovate in the same way as Google can, for instance. If you are a web-based company, it's very easy to try and test things. So you know, at eBay, they can do A-B testing on a home page and get data um, very quickly to see what's different. If you're building a microprocessor, you can't do that. If you're building a, a new drug, and you have a regulatory process and a, have to go through clinical trials in the FDA, obviously you can't innovate in the same way. So I think that you have to be very careful not to look at an innovative company and it, take it as a template and put on what you want. That said, let me give you a couple of examples. Pixar, in my opinion, has a phenomenal baseline culture of innovation. And I don't just say that because they're part of Disney and I'm on the board of Disney. But um, when I went there the first time, I was blown away by the, um, their attitude towards failure, their openness, and the way they uh, constructively criticize each other and give each other input. The uh, dialogue between the technologists and the artists um, and how they interplay the uh, openness in the environment, yet the, uh, their ability to self-assess. Uh, just unbelievable culture of innovation, in my opinion. Google, for instance, I think from a questioning perspective, um, has that down. They're, they're very you know, internally willing to question, encourage question, encourage crazy ideas, as long as people are also willing to have those ideas 
shot down. Google's 20% time doesn't apply to a lot of businesses. So uh, I don't use them as a template to say that that would ab uh, apply uh, in, in every business. Um, you know, I can go through some, uh, I interviewed a little company for my book called Intuitive Surgical, which is, uh, builds a robot for uh, aiding surgery. And I walked away from there and said, this is an innovative culture. You could tell, again, the openness, the willingness to try, the looking forward, the communication flow. So it's one of those things that you know it when you see it. Um, but more companies claim they're innovative than are. And it, it's hard. And the, as it grows, it gets harder and harder. Okay, I apologize. I thought I was going to stop earlier. So. <laughs>